The African American experience in France was so radically different from the U.S. in the early 20th century. The enlisted men and officers who came during World War I experienced no racial prejudice for the first time in their lives. They returned home to spread the word. Not surprisingly, a flood of artists, writers, entertainers flocked to France eager to escape the persistence and lethal racism of the U.S. One of the most prominent pioneers for this African American movement was a soldier by the name of James Reese Europe. James Europe was born in Mobile, Alabama on February 22, 1881. Both of his parents were musicians, and when Europe was 10, his family moved to Washington, D.C., where he studied violin with Enrico Hurley, the assistant director of the Marine Corps Band. At the start of World War I, Europe enlisted as a private in the Army. After passing the officer's exam, he was asked by his commander, Colonel William Hayward, to form a military band as part of the combat unit. Europe felt that it would be hard for, to convince New York City musicians to leave their highly paid jobs to go to war, but Colonel Way Hayward instructed Europe to get whatever musicians he could. And he did just that, even traveling all the way to Puerto Rico to recruit his reed players. When the unit arrived in France on New Year's Day 1918, it was the first African American combat unit to set foot on French soil. Europe's band entertained troops and citizens in every city they visited and they received great enthusiasm. Noble Sissel said at the time that the jazz germ hit France and it spread everywhere they went. Europe and his band returned triumphantly to New York on February 12, 1919 and soon began to tour American cities. The final concert on the, of the tour was at Mechanic Hall in Boston on May 9, 1919. The evening when one of the percussion twins, Herbert Wright, became angered by Europe's strict directions. He attacked the band leader with a knife during the intermission. Europe's jugular vein was severed and the next day the papers carried the headline, The Jazz King is Dead. Continuing with an African American influence in music, I moved to another musician by the name of Sidney Bichette. Sidney Bichette was born in New Orleans on May 14, 1897, to a middle-class Creole family. Bichette's family heritage is important, first because it gave him a background in French language. Second, Bichette believed that jazz music, France, and Africa all were connected because jazz began in New Orleans. Music was important to Bichette's family. His father, a shoemaker, played the flute as a hobby and all four of his Sydney's brothers played musical instruments. Bichette first played the clarinet, but soon fell in love with the soprano saxophone. During class, we read about Bichette's experience in the City of Lights, with the different egos flowing through Paris of aspiring musicians, angers flared anytime they disagreed. Some of these artists would hold personal vendettas as they would have small feuds against one another. Bichette was known for his temper, which ended up getting him in enough trouble that caused him to have to leave Paris. Due to the violence in Montmartre, many musicians carried guns. Bichette himself said, you could be sure if you had a gun on you. One night, Bichette was leaving the club and was pursued by a fellow jazz musician named Mike McKendrick. A small dispute turned into a gunfight in the streets that wounded multiple people. The fight was not Bichette's idea and he was mad that anyone got hurt. He was arrested shortly thereafter, imprisoned for a year, and then deported from France. The City of Lights drew the interest of many prominent African American figures. Even though Langston Hughes wasn't a household name yet, he still gave his shot in Little America. In his autobiography, The Big C, Hughes outlines his experience living in Paris in 1924. He describes in detail his first day, the story of a young black man who begins a life as a child of a poor family in the Midwest. The first decade of this century and eventually leaves his family behind to a new life in the streets of Paris. The first struggle he must overcome is poverty as he tries to survive off $7. From this $7 he managed to buy one bedroom apartment and is able to last until he is able to stand on his own feet. The book can be followed through a fascination as a success story, with a chronicle of adventures and also a full and living individuals with colorful scenes. It can be remembered more thoughtfully as a personal recreation of Negro life from pre-war days through war and post-war conditions against backgrounds of contrast both in place and time.
but it is profound quality and lasting worth are to be found in the fact that from the first and last through all of these other experiences and observation it remains both sensitive and poised candid and reticent realistic and unembittered next thing he was said life is a big sea full of fish i let down my net and pull it is a poet who is a fisher and the poet's miracle of combining subjectivity with detachment is in the gathering of the net. The final African American experience I would like to delve into is Claude McKay. McKay was a key figure in the Harlem Renaissance, a prominent literary movement of the 1920s. His work ranged from vernacular verses celebrating peasant life in Jamaica to poems challenging white authorities in America, and from generally straightforward tales of black life in both Jamaica, Africa, and even France to more philosophically ambitious fictions addressing intellectual duality, which McKay found central in the black individual's efforts to cope with in the racist society. McKay's descriptive novel of low life in Marseille brings into focus the dilemma of North American black after the First World War, and it can be seen despite its apparent lack of literary pension as part of a literary movement of all the Americas which is set in the motion of reevaluation of black culture in the continent. The North American black returned from war with a wider and more ambitious attitude to his own position in society, partly inspired by his experience in a Europe relatively free of racism and partly by American wartime propaganda about the quality of life in the United States. His frustration and disappointment in peacetime led on the one hand to riots and to others, to a strengthen of Negro improvement organization and overall to an increased race, which co coincided and often encouraged a similar awakening in the Spanish and French speaking Caribbeans. This is the background to Banjo. The motive of the character is to escape from the disillusionment of American society into an irresponsibility of beach coming in Europe. While at the same time, the novel itself is an attempt to return to whatever racial roots are still available to the decultured Afro-American. Bandro is a sketch of the black personality by a black writer, and it pans across the whole range of blackness. The love affair between Paris and the African-American community continues to this date. Businesses cater specifically to African-American travelers or travelers interested in Af African-American history. Popular soul food restaurants are often more popular with the French than they are with tourists. Similarly, the plethora of jazz clubs and jazz festivals seem more popular in Paris than they are in the country of its birth. Any idealistic view I had of the city before reading these authors' experience has given way to a much more pragmatic and realistic one. And yet, my personal experience in the city has yet to come. The sense of freedom that I've read about gives me a new perspective of Paris. This class and major project has opened my eyes to, to one day travel the world.